So it's my pleasure to get started today and introduce our speaker, Professor Lawrence Lee Jr. from the University of Tennessee. Uh, Lawrence or Larry started doing particle physics as a graduate student at Yale, working on the ATLAS experiment. Um, since then, Larry has then been a postdoc at the University of Adelaide, a postdoc at Harvard University, and now a junior faculty member at University of Tennessee. And has done work on all sorts of things, detector work on the new small wheel muon system for ATLAS, <clears throat> lots of physics work, and we're going to hear some of, of ideas about physics searches today in this seminar. So without further ado, here's Larry. Thank you very much for the nice intro, and thanks for, uh, for having me and having us. Uh, it's been really great to get to know uh, all y'all and, and to see some old friends. Yeah, so um, if this you may have not uh, heard me give a talk in the past few years, but if you had, uh, you would have heard me talk about long with particles. It's something that I've been doing a whole lot of over the past kind of six or seven years. And uh, it's not what I'm going to talk about today, but it's, of course, what you heard uh, yesterday in the whole thing if you were there. Um, but the reason that that was really interesting and, and something I'm still interested in is that I think it's one of the still the, one of the most compelling ways to solve this problem that I'll start off talking about. And I'll, I'll talk about a, a different uh, compelling way to talk about this unnaturalness uh, of nature. So this can be distilled in my super hand wavy way uh, into a, a single question, a really simple question. And that is, why is the Higgs so light? Now you might say, Larry, what are you talking about? I know that the Higgs is actually pretty heavy, right? It's it's going to be 125 times more massive than the proton, right? It is not a light particle. Uh, and in fact, it's, of course, the second heaviest particle that we have in the standard model. Um, but still, the question is, why, why is it so light? And the reason that this is an interesting question to ask is that in the standard model, the observable Higgs mass that we can actually see in our experiments, this MH, this will be all the squares, is uh, going to have two different kinds of contributions. There's going to be something that is going to be the bare mass that's going to come, that's just going to be the, uh, the uh, a parameter in your Lagrangian. Right? But then there's going to be, as is the case throughout all of Q of T, uh, some quantum corrections that kick in right? due to interactions of that particle with other things. So that's great. Um, but we only have access to this thing on the left. We only know how to measure that, and we do, and we know it quite well to be 125 GP. The thing is, in the standard model, these quantum corrections at the end, the standard model is telling us that these should scale as lambda u v squared, where the, the, the squared mass uh, corrections. And lambda u v is the ultraviolet cutoff of the standard model, right? So the standard model is an effective field theory at some energy scale, it's got to stop working, right? Because it doesn't explain everything. So at some energy scale, it's got to stop working and that energy scale is lambda UV. Now, the, where we start running into problems is when we say there's the standard model and there's gravity, you kind of shove them together and then that's, that's our universe. And the thing is, we know, where gravity, we know what the gravitational scale is, and that is the Planck mass, right? So if the, the standard model applies until gravity kicks in, then that means that the standard model should apply all the way up to the Planck mass. The real issue comes from the fact that the Planck mass is really large. Okay. So great. So we have this, if you square, you get 10 to the 38 GeV squared. So let's let's distill this down. Let's remove the units and just talk about some numbers for a second. This is saying in this limit where the standard model and gravity is everything, and we're taking the standard model super seriously, we have a number that's order 10 to the 4 equals some question mark minus some other number that's order 10 to the 38. Now, this is one equation, one unknown. This is an easy problem to do. We know what this question mark is, right? But the problem is, we know that it has to be order 10 to the 38, and that it has to cancel off whatever that number is on the right by 34 decimal places, right, in order to get to the right answer. 
So if we are taking the standard model a little too seriously, then we're going to end up needing to have the bare mass and these quantum corrections canceling to 34 decimal places in order for everything to, to kind of be consistent. And to kind of drive, uh, drive home this point, uh, imagine, okay, so this, this here is pi or some of the first numbers of pi. If I came along and I said, you know, I have a, a, a new constant pi or whatever, and I showed this to you, and for 34 decimal places, it matched pi perfectly. I said, hey, no, no, it has nothing to do with pi. You'd, you'd say I'm crazy, right? So I'd, I'd lied to you or something, right? Um, so of course, there's something deeply connected here. Um, and, and you would want to say that there's something deeply connecting the bare mass and these quantum corrections. But in the standard model, there is no such uh, connection. Okay, these are completely different numbers coming from completely different corners, uh, uh, different mechanisms. But again, if you take the standard model all too seriously, it says that this is a coincidence. This is a one in 10 to the 34 coincidence that's happened. So that's all sorts of fishy. And this is what we'll call the naturalness problem. And that's to say that your theory is unnatural. If you have unrelated numbers that cancel to 34 decimal places like this. Uh, can I make a comment here? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I know that you're giving a, a seminar on, uh, <laughs> on a different topic, but you're getting us started on this naturalist problem. I, I just to keep you honest and everybody else know the facts, the uh, this problem you're discussing is one of perturbation theory being pushed into a zone where it's unstable. I agree. So it's not a feature of the standard model. It's a yeah. feature of interpretations of perturbation theory extrapolated over 34 decimal places. And, right. and so uh, it's it's not mandatory for an experimental physicist to think the standard model actually has this problem okay i and i also this isn't your particular issue i hope it's just a preamble to what you are going to get ready to say for sure <laughs> of course um yeah no I, I couldn't agree more absolutely um you know this is this is just a a, a weirdness that we should you know uh, know of right in in terms of how we're going to guide ourselves but you know of course we, we're not necessarily uh, uh, nailed to this problem here. So the thing is, I'm going to call this the naturalist problem. And some people might have problems with that being called a problem, but okay. this is only related to something that I, I think is very much a problem, the hierarchy problem, the gauge hierarchy problem. And that's to say that, that these are very related because this thing up here was only ever an issue because the Planck mass was so much uh, larger than the Higgs mass or the electric scale, right? So this is another way of saying this, this sentence, why is gravity so much weaker than the other forces in some sense? So because of that large hierarchy, then you've induced this weird thing uh, that, that seems to show up, yeah. So the hierarchy problem is talking about uh, difference in the magnitude of force. Difference in scales, yeah. But naturalness is more related to Higgs mass or these. I, I Higgs see this problem Higgs. as what this does to the Higgs, to the Higgs spectrum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're often quite sloppy about this and we use these interchangeably. Um, but, but I think it's useful to, to keep these as separate ideas. Um, I won't say it much. Late. Well, okay. we might come back to this. So, if we zoom into these quantum corrections and try to understand what what's, what goes into them, okay, we'll see that uh, you're going to have contributions for fermions and bosons, and that's great. So, so we can split them up that way. Remember that the Higgs likes to couple the heavy particles. That's kind of why they're heavy. Um, and uh, then though those couplings are going to give rise to these terms. So as a result, the top quark of course, the heaviest standard model particle will be the worst offender here in terms of giving a sensitivity to this lambda u. Let's just store that in. So that's to say, to, 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 to the highest order, you have, um, or to the lead, leading 
most order, uh, these corrections will be the corrections due to the top. And so that'll be, in this case, um, you'll have uh, some minus sign that comes in because it's fermion. You have some, some thing in the front uh, given the quantum numbers of the top. And then you have this nasty uh, lambda UV squared that we didn't like. Now, going back to this, if we look at the structure of these, and I just hinted at this, the fermionic uh, terms will come in with a minus sign, the bosonic terms will come in with a plus sign, okay? at, at leading levels. Say. So they're going to contribute with opposite signs. And the problem is, is uh, this delta m squared is getting really big because it's too sensitive to this UV cutoff uh, like that. So what if we could just make this less sensitive? And one possible solution is to make uh, these quantum corrections less sensitive to this UV cutoff, uh, perhaps by recognizing that these fermions of bosons have come in with opposite sign in this. And then again, a leading order, there are other uh, effects here, but maybe we can add a new particle that has the same quantum numbers uh, as the top, except maybe uh, it's spin, right? Which will pop out this plus sign, and then we can kind of deflate this problem. So this is, of course, what I'm hinting at is, is then given by supersymmetry. And in supersymmetry, it's, it's just a statement that there is this fundamental symmetry between fermions and bosons in the spin space. And just uh, for example, although I think you guys all know this, um, you, know, you can have, for example, or, or spin one half fermions, uh, for example, just the electron uh, or one of the quarks. And we have a rotation in spin space by a half a unit. So that'll give rise to our SUSY partners. Uh, for example, here the, the scalar electron or the scalar quark uh, and the electron of the quarks. So the, the point is simply that if every standard model particle uh, has some, some partner with the same quantum numbers except for that spin, we can cancel off to a large degree these uh, quadratic divergences. So say, for example, the SUSY scale, right, where these, uh, these particles are starting to show up, is at the TeV scale. That's already saying that the standard model has a problem when you get to the TeV scale, right? Because the standard model doesn't include SUSY, so lambda UV would have to be down there. If that were true, we work this out. That's 10 to the 6 GeV squared. This is now just a 1% level problem instead of that 1 and 10 to the 34. So this is in some way. You know, it's all a matter of taste to dial it in, but let's say we're okay with a 1% coincidence coming out of our theory. Then we have some hint from nature for where to look at the TV scale. This is great because we happen to have a collider that is a TV scale collider. Okay. So uh, I'm glossing over a lot of this, but in general, supersymmetry is pretty super. There's a lot of stuff that comes out of it. That's really fantastic. You can help deflate this naturalness problem as I, as I very quickly outlined. Uh, some things like electroweak symmetry breaking just kind of falls out. Uh, you give some hope for gauge coupling unification. Um, you can uh, often easily explain uh, uh, the dark matter uh, with some particles uh, and then a, a slightly more formal uh, AHLS uh, theorem, uh, which is something that I like, but I don't actually. So the point is that you start off with a fairly simple postulate that fermions and bosons, there's some symmetry there. Okay? You write down a Lagrangian that has all the gauge invariant terms given those symmetries. So just write it all there. And then you just solve the standard model problems. Right? It's, it's not quite that simple, but it's basically that simple. That's the recipe. Okay? And I can only think of like one downside to having the universe uh, to, to, to this model, right? And that's that it doesn't seem to exist. <laughs> so we, you know, now have spent more than a decade at the LHC trying to find evidence for this. And this is one of the standard uh, uh, kind of too hard to read bar charts that has way too many things on it. But the point is that you can kind of see that we have lots and lots of exclusions up to around the TEV scale. We've looked uh, around this region of this, you know, whatever 1% uh, level fine tuning, this kind of thing. Um, 
and, and we've just come up with a whole lot of exclusions. Yeah. And so then if it was up to the 10 TV scale, then is it something like 0.01% or something? It just gets less and less. Yeah, uh, yeah, there would be another order of magnitude in there, but but actually this is perfect. So th this is an old plot, but the, the, in here this is these are two Susie mass parameters, uh, and on the color axis you have this delta, and you can kind of think of this as a one in delta fine tuning. So the higher the color axis, the worse situation you're in in terms of that level of fine tuning. So let's say you want to be in the kind of order one percent, something like that. You want to be out in this dark blue. Um, that's, but that means that as we start to exclude this region down here, uh, we are forcing ourselves into situations of more and more uh, fine tuning. Yeah. And then again, yes, it's a matter of taste or how much you're willing to accept in some sense. Um, but the whole picture, we're starting to get a little bit nervous about this, or we have been for the last few years. It's, uh, nothing, nothing's kind of popped out. So the question that, that uh, I'm trying to, to ask is, are there any opportunities left to discover some BSM at or below the GUV scale of the LHC? And what I want to focus on here is, is the situation uh, where you have limits, current limits that might be really weak because of very large factors. Which is to say, we've had more than a decade of LHC searches why haven't we found anything? Well, maybe we were trying to hope that on top of the LHC backgrounds, we would have just a nice little bump. We'd find something and you know, we'd you know, wash our hands. We're just like, okay, we <laughs> get, give us our Nobels. Um, but what if it's actually you know, buried under these LHC backgrounds and is not quite that simple? So in order to start to tell the story, I wanna uh, talk about um, a variation, although I'm going to consider it more uh, more canonical than that, of supersymmetry, and that comes in the form of this R parity violation. So R parity in SUSY uh, is as written on the slide there. So this is this is the sign of the number R, uh, and so it's so it's minus one to to, to the number R. Uh, so this ex exponent there, this exponent is going to have our baryon number of our particle. Going to have a lepton number, and then finally spin. Okay. So, in order to talk about our parity violation, we need to talk about our parity conservation, which is the, the standard thing that we do when we search for supersymmetry. Okay. Our parity is super partnerness in some sense. So, for the most part, you can think of it as if a particle has a value plus one, it's a standard model particle, and if it has minus one, then it's a super particle. Great. If you conserve R parity, you have some really important phenomenological uh, uh, consequences. So for one, it means, so, so basically it comes down to every vertex that you have will have to have an even number of particles. That could be zero, uh, but that could be two. So that will give rise to particle pair production at standard model colliders. At the LHC, we have standard model particles that we're colliding. So we, we're going to get uh, at least two uh, particles that we're not going to get just one. So you can't get single production. And this also means that if you have a particle, its decay must have an odd number of particles. Um, so that would mean that for the lightest one of these, it is kinematically forbidden to decay at all. So it's going to be stable. So we have a stable lightest supersymmetric particle, uh, the LSP. And that's great because that could be the dark matter. Fantastic. Um, notice if you have conservation of baryon number and lepton number in your theory, then our party is going to be conserved. Okay, so these are, these are closely related things. And the vast majority of SUSY searches assume that in the signal, this thing is conserved. Okay. Now, the thing is, in this picture I had earlier, this, this nice little formula for getting down to, uh, to, to a theory and solutions, is there was a bit of a skip step in here, a step 2.5, where we just threw away a bunch of terms that we didn't like. Okay, and this is something that is, uh, um, 
school on this and much of the rest of the talk talking about. It. So, so then the question is, why, why did we do this? Why do we want to conserve our parity? Why is it that we only ever talk, or very often only ever talk about our parity conserving models? So we say things like, well, we want that stable LSP so we can have dark matter. Right? That is a good reason for sure. It would be nice if that were the case. We also say things like baryon number and lepton number conserved in the standard model. So why wouldn't they be on the Susan side? When in fact, even if RPV allows for the LSP to decay, you can still have other dark matter. That's great. Like the, the fact that you don't have a neutralino wimp giving you your dark matter does not mean that, that you can't fit dark matter into this picture. And then also baryon number and lepton number in the standard model, these are not fundamental symmetries. These are so-called accidental symmetries. Um, and that is to say that they're just, they're just not fundamental in any way. And in fact, the standard model does violate them non-perturbatively. So holding on to this BNL conservation from the standard model um, uh, at the diagram level seems like a, not a great motivation for RPC in, in my view. Um, so that's to say, when you are actually constructing the MSSM, you get all of these terms out. In that, at least the way I like to say it, the MSSM is our parity violating until you throw away those terms, until you set those couplings to zero. So for me, it seems even more constructed manually for bit those couplings. So if we don't throw away those terms, this is what we end up with. We end up with new couplings between these uh, super multiplets, some that violate lepton number conservation, and some that violate parity number conservation. So this is the general RPV super potential in the MSSM. And one thing that's really great about this is you can, uh, as an experimentalist, it's fantastic because you can generate whatever damn signal you want. There's a lot of new couplings here and a lot of things uh, to play with. Um, so now, now that we've turned off this RPC, at colliders, we can have single production of particles and we can have the LSP decay. And just very quickly, there's a lot of nice uh, phenomenological aspects here. You, because you have so many parameters to play with, uh, you can, for example, uh, uh, create neutrino masses and, and mixing at tree level or one loop level. You can help explain the B physics anomalies quite easily. You can uh, help explain G minus two anomaly uh, really well. Um, there's lots of new room in all these couplings for new CP violation, which is fantastic for uh, uh, understanding variant asymmetry. And the best thing for me is that these non-zero couplings greatly weaken the LHC limits. And that's because usually it's because the, the LSP is decaying and not giving you the same amount of MET that you were hoping to have in, in terms of what you assumed you would get. So there is so much power here and so much discovery potential once you allow these couplings. Uh, so for me, if your symmetry, uh, if your symmetries allow these couplings, uh, and you don't have a good reason for getting rid of them, um, you know, it, it's, it's quite a leap to, to kind of make one up. So now to actually talk about how how this would look. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can only turn on a few at a time, though, right? That's right. Like your yeah. That's right. So in in general, the easiest way to do that is to either turn on left time number uh, violation or turn on barrier number violation. If you turn on both, then you will, in, in general, uh, get uh, rapid proton decay. Um, but you can also do things uh, like play in the flavor space. These, these, uh, these subscripts here are generational in some way. Um, so, so you can, for example, have large heavy flavor couplings, which, uh, which then are not giving you um, the, the proton decay as, as quickly. Yeah. Okay, so not all RPV CC implies per time decay because right. there's so many handles. That's right, that. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th th there are, I have a backup slide, we can talk about this later, but um, there are lots of low energy constraints here. You can imagine you have so many knobs that there, there are places where you can, there, there are pitfalls here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but there's also lots of uh, uh, un uncovered, 
uh, unexploited space when they low energy side. Yeah, that's great. Okay, great. So, like I said, one thing you can do is have uh, sparticle single production, and then you can have sparticles that decay entirely to standard model particles once you turn these things on. So, for example, I'm focusing now on this variant number violating term at the end. So this is, of course, quite a simple example and one that maps onto the most canonical hadron collider search you could possibly have, and that's just a digenerate resonance search. You're producing, uh, uh, you're taking two parts from the proton that you're colliding, you fuse them into one new heavy, heavy thing, in this case a stop, and then that thing will decay into two quarks, which give you your two jets. So forgive me if this is a little too basic, but it, but it sets up later. I set up the, the later discussion. So we're going to measure each of these outgoing jets as four vectors in our detector. Then we sum those together and get the four momentum of this new particle. Relativity then tells us how to go from that to an invariant mass, which is of course square. And then we can plot that mass. And uh, uh, it, you can see in this in this plot over here. And you're going to have these signals that arise, which will be uh, peaking in this in this invariant mass. And then your background is some steeply falling, smooth, featureless kind of thing. Great. That is, of course, the most canonical uh, thing you can look for at the LHC. Um, now let's make it a step more, uh, a little bit less simple. And now, what if you're having pair production of these things? And each of those is decaying into those two jets again. So now we have four jets, we have two times two jets. And increasing the, the final state multiplicity here is going to induce some combinatorial problems. Which is to say that if you get the pairings right, then you can uh, reconstruct the invariant masses of these stops. Here, I'll be assuming that they have the same mass for stops. So if you do that correctly, you get the nice peak that allows you to discriminate it from your background. If you combine them incorrectly, then you don't get that sharp peak. You'll get some featureless thing uh, and that uh, sucks. So that's going to make the signal a lot harder to find because now you have some combinatorial data. And in fact, if you brute force this problem, if you just loop over all the possible combinations here, we're, we're going to have this, this combinatorial background uh, a lot. So in this scenario here, your wrong combinations are going to give you some featureless thing, and you're correct uh, that nice peak where you, you want to detect it. So in this case, at leading order, not including radiation or anything like that, um, there are three possible configurations. That's going to be a four choose two. But then there's a symmetry uh, uh, where it's going to be uh, uh, two times that. So you get a divide by two. Uh, so there are three possible configurations here. Okay? And you can see the, uh, the possible configurations. There's kind of a red team and a blue team for the variance. Okay. Great. So, but only one of them is correct. So right off the bat, you have a 200% combinatorial background if you just brute force this problem. And then there's, of course, the probability that you would have some uh, uh, extra radiation in your event that makes the problem significantly harder because then you have a, for example, if you have one extra jet, then you have a five choose four, and then a four choose two divided by two. So in this example, if you just plot the invariant mass, the invariant masses of these pairs, looping over every possible combination, every possible interpretation of the event, you would end up with a plot like this. And you can see there's a lot of diffuse stuff here in the mass versus mass plane. And what you would want to see is a nice peak, uh, 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 in this case, is a 1 TV stop at 1 TV, 1 TV. And by eye, we can certainly see that there is a feature of this cycle. But if we actually look at the numbers, that's 30% of this uh, uh, collection is in that inside of that box, 70% is outside of it. So we can tell that there's something there. So we can kind of deal with this, but the combinatorics are already becoming a bit of a problem. So how do we approach this? We can uh, 
uh, uh, perform what, what I'll call classical combinatorial solutions. So we're trying to figure out how to pair these four jets together into two sets. You can, for example, do, and this is what all of the analyses so far looking for this final state have done, um, minimize this delta R sum variable. And this is basically looking for a small opening angle with some offset C to set a scale. Um, trying to, to angularly correlate these things. You can also do something like a mass asymmetry and choose the interpretation of the event where the mass difference here is smallest. That would be smart, but nobody's done that for this particular search for some reason. And it's possible to sit down and try to construct these, these, um, these variables because the multiplicity is quite low. We have just a handful of things to play with and we can, we can play this game. So in the classical two times two jet analysis, what you would do is uh, use this delta R sum minimization to figure out an interpretation of the event, which jets should go with which. That would hopefully give peaking signals in some average mass distribution. And then you would compare that to your steeply falling background uh, and you do a long time. And if we look real quickly at this plot in the notes from the middle, yes, we can clearly see a peak, but for many of these, you have uh, a lot of junk away from the peak that you, that you were hoping to actually get. So this is, this is already uh, giving a large population of mis, uh, misassigned jets in some way. So uh, for this particular analysis, CMS has a, a very similar analysis, uh, but this is here, the Atlas one. We can do this, but the sensitivity is pretty bad. I mean, the limits are running out at 400 GeV. So that's to say, if the stop decays in this way, is produced and decays in this way, and it's just out of reach. We have a fantastic Susie with, you know, a stop at 500 GeV, and, you know, this is, this is the dream of the LHC. And that's to say that maybe some of these non-zero RPD couplings have prevented a discovery of something that is, is our dream, that it really has low mass uh, Susie particles around. Okay. But I started off talking about this combinatorial solution, this delta R sum that this analysis used and all of them have used. In order to get this small delta R sum value, these stops need to be boosted. And now if we look in the delta R versus PT of the stop plane, you're only going to, 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 to see these small delta R values when you're over to the right. You're cutting pretty hard in the tails of the stop PT distribution. So let's say you're throwing away a whole lot of your signal once you're making this requirement that, this, that the angles be correlated in this way. So you can see the shape here. This is this classic, uh, if anyone has done uh, boosted stuff, this is this 2M over PT kind of uh, uh, characteristic scale for the opening angle. And, and, and so this is where this is coming from. So the question is, can we do better than this in terms of the assignment of these pairings? And in particular, can we do this in a way that scales to harder problems? to higher multiplicity problems. Because the thing is, yes, we're focusing on this diagram right here, the two times two, but there's, there's, uh, it's, it's incredibly easy to come up with models that will uh, uh, go to much higher multiplicities. And then, so and here I end this, this little slide um, with two times five, but it's even quite easy to get larger multiplicities. Okay, great. So I do want to focus on this two times five a little bit. This last diagram over here. This diagram is significantly more complex than the two times two for a number of reasons. Uh, you have pair production of some particle 
which is going to decay to two jets plus an on-shell neutralino in this case. That on-shell neutralino is then decaying to three jets within RPD coupling. So what you're going to have is if you want to reconstruct the Gluino mass in this case, you need to find the correct five jet ensemble within this 10 jets final state. So you have this again, this 10 choose five divided by two. So there's 126 ways of figuring that out. But there's even more information here because each of these five jet resonances has inside of it a three jet resonance that's embedded in there. So if you also want to reconstruct that, if you also want to correctly interpret that, you have another a factor of 10 for each of these. Okay. So in the end, there are more than 12,000 wrong views of this event for the one correct view of this event. Okay. But the thing is, there is lots of kinematic information here. There's a lot of stuff that we can use. We don't have to necessarily brute force this problem. Right, because indeed brute forcing isn't going to work because we have these 12,000 wrong answers. But the thing is that we have 10 four vectors, again, at leading order, not including radiation. So the information is in a 10 times four, a 40 dimensional space, 40 dimensional kinematic feature space here. And that's to say that we're going to have a real hard time constructing useful variables by hand in 40 dimensions. We don't know how to effectively think in 40 dimensions. Right? So this is then where um, the we can ask, can the machine learning side help here? And, and so this is really important because many applications of machine learning in HEP will say stuff like, the signal looks like the background, so let's just throw it into some deep neural net and see what it can do. And, and I think we've all heard that a bunch. I think we've said that. But remember, machine learning isn't magic. It's just kind of a crap ton of linear algebra, a little bit of calculus, right? Like it's, it's not magic. We have to keep that in mind always. Now, the thing is, this particular situation is not the same as that. This is not that our signal and our background look really similar, and we're trying to invent some, some uh, extra discrimination power there. They look super different. It's just that they look really different in some 40 dimensional space. And it's just hard for us to, to capture that. It's not that we have too little information, it's that we have, in some way, way too much information. Like, you can see how rich this is kinematically. So, if you play this game of trying to figure out what the uh, combinatorial problem is as a function of increasing complexity, <coughs> let's call it the percent combinatorial background. Okay, so how, how many uh, uh, wrong interpretations are there? This really blows up as you go to these higher multiplicities. If you include these uh, uh, embedded resonance effects, then you get even higher numbers up there. And partially because you have to get rid of this huge combinatorial background, you start cutting away really hard to throw away that background. And as a result, these are just some example search efficiencies you start throwing away your signal as well. You start uh, uh, cutting a bit too hard in order to find anything. And so as a result, the LHC limits, as you get to more and more complex stuff over here, tend to be kind of bad right now. And it's a real shame because, <coughs> as I said before, the one, this is really well motivated. And there's a lot of interesting discovery potential left. And I didn't go through these numbers uh, at all, but you know, there are limits that run out well before a 500 GeV stop. In some cases, a 1.2 TeV Gluino could not be more the LHC dream. 200 GeV Gluinos. This is exactly the recipe you need for an incredibly uh, nice Susie, right? One that uh, we, we really hoped for when we turned on the LHC. So I want to uh, step through a little bit the two times two problems. So this is where we're going to start uh, trying to actually tackle this way in a way that's scalable to these larger multiplicities, hopefully. Um, so indeed, let's try to capture this high dimensional information in a neural net. Um, 
So the question is, what, how, what is our input going to be to this network? And some HEP applications will throw in the full form momentum, like all of the momenta you have. And they'll do something like this, where you hand in a row of numbers uh, and you describe your form momenta in, a, in some Cartesian way, you know, PXP, YPZ, E. And you describe that in some orthogonal coordinate system. That's fantastic. You then hand it to some fully connected network, just some simple neural network here. And that's fantastic. Your input is constructed such that the network has an easy time uh, summing these together. Because of course, that's going to be an important piece of this. You're going to sum them together, and then you're going to find uh, these peaking masses. Right? So the summing is easy because it's in some orthogonal coordinate system. It just adds components, right? It can figure that out, and that's fantastic. That's really easy. But once it has the parent particle, form momentum nicely added, the actual discrimination power comes in the form of the mass of that thing. So now we're asking this network to then learn how to convert those four numbers into a mass, which is less easy for it to figure out. And it's a little silly because we know how to do that. We know how to square something with the Minkowski metric in the middle, right? That's easy. Okay, so maybe we try to be a little more clever and we hand it instead something in a more particle physics basis. At the beginning, we say MPTA to thumb. And so, great, there are masses now. It doesn't need to worry about that so much. But now it needs to figure out how to add these things because it's not just going to be as simple as adding the components. That it wants to. So, again, we've taken a problem that we know how to solve for vector addition. And we're asking it to figure out how to do that. So what we've done in some recent work is to uh, try and um, well use some of the ideas from, from other people that have been around for a couple of years now, uh, but for this particular problem. And so we're using something called the Lorenz layer. And the idea is to construct a neural network that in some way knows about relativity. So instead of handing it four vector components in a one dimensional array. We're actually handing it four vector objects. These rectangles here are meant to uh, signify a four vector. This is a coupling of those, of those four numbers. Great. So we input those four momenta, then we send it into what's called a combination layer, which just knows how to take linear combinations of those inputs. So again, we know how to add four vectors. We just add it to a layer. And then we hand this into this Lorenz layer. And this Lorenz layer has the job of interpreting four numbers. This is actually a really simple layer, it's a static operation. It receives four numbers and outputs some physics quantity. It says, give me, give me a four vector in your Cartesian coordinate system or whatever, and I will give you back the mass. And we'll give you back the k angle, this kind of thing. So that's great. And then we have those numbers in the yellow there, and then those are made available. To, to the rest of the neural network to actually do discrimination now in a physics basis. Now, the nice thing here is, and, and the, 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 the really important part, is that these combinations are learned. The actual weights, the actual in, uh, combinations of the inputs, this is a learned thing. Okay. Good. And we send this into some traditional. Uh, uh, neural network, um, and the goal here is then to just reduce the dimensionality of the problem and to give us interpretation of the event. So this network uh, that we lovingly call uh, Cannonball, which stands for Combinatoric Artificial Neural Network on backronym Lorenz layer, because you got to fit the word backronym into the backronym. <laughs> it couldn't help itself. Um, and the thing is, so we don't output a single score. We don't say signal like or background like. We output an interpretation of the event. Which jets should you look at, like, or which jet should you throw away, for example, because it looks like radiation? And what should the pairing of the jets be? So it's just this interpretation of the event. Then the nice thing here is that then traditional analysis methods can kick in. Then you can do just your normal bump hunt now with just a cleaner mass peak. Uh, from your combinatorial solution. 
And really importantly, this includes also the systematics treatment. Uh, I think this is something that has been missing in a whole lot of uh, the machine learning and health world is, is a, a convincing answer to how do you handle systematics. Yeah. So once you've trained it to um, give you this combination score, then using that discriminator, you don't have to iterate through all these combinations. You, you essentially let exactly. the network do that. Exactly. And you have one interpretation that you do the rest of the analysis with. Yeah. Then you do your bump hunt. Because it's based learned, on those it's learned which ones to pick. Yeah. So this is uh, work that has uh, largely been done by uh, Grad student Anthony Bidea uh, at Harvard, oh, I'm no longer there. Um, uh, and uh, I just want to give credit for a lot of this work. So we can ask the question how well does this technique do? So, first off, so, so this plot is the fraction of events correct. So you want to be close to one. Uh, and this is a function of the, the mass of the stop. So, this delta R sum minimization, which again has been used in every analysis looking for events does terribly, does really, really, really poorly. And it gets even worse at higher stop masses. It's because we're throwing away, uh, we're selecting, it only works in this high PT tail. Our cannonball performs something like 30 times better at a reasonable uh, value of this epsilon, which is some smearing parameter, just to kind of make things a little more uh, realistic. And it's also fairly robust to that sphere. We're also doing much better than this mass minimization. That's what the A minimization is, this asymmetry, this mass asymmetry. And this also improves this mass, which is the thing we like to see. They try to understand what information we are getting out of this. What is it learning? What, where is this performance increase coming from? We uh, look at we define a particular tail divergence. This is just a measure of how much two PDFs differ. That's all it is, right? Um, and so that's to say this KL divergence, we want to have a small value. In truth, if, if you take if you have the correct answer, uh, then it'll be zero. So what we're doing here is we're looking at the four dimensions of the PDFs of the stop for momentum. Okay, the parent particle form momentum. Basically, if you get the parent form momentum correct, then you should be at zero. We can bin that in PT, and we'll get this plot here. So as you can see, the delta R sum in green does okay at high PT. Right? It correctly gets the, the rest of the uh, components of the, the form momentum, it, it predicts those well. But at low PT, it shoots shoots up. Really. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And, and then the smearing of the PT in this epsilon. So here, this epsilon is uh, twenty percent. So the twenty percent PT smearing to add a little bit of realism there. Yeah. Exactly. We we wanted to make sure it worked here because if it doesn't work here, it'll never work. Right. So, um, but you can see where a lot of the power of cannonballs coming in is in this low PT region. So even without the boost of these things, we're able to get the right answer. Uh, and, and, and it's really quite robust against that. So uh, the thing that you would actually use in the end in your actual analysis isn't the KL divergence. It's of course gonna be an invariant mass, right? You wanna still do that bump hunt for this search. And so the question is how well does it reproduce the line shape of the of, of your actual signal? That's to say, if you have a better combinatorial solution, you'll get a peakier mass. And then, if you have a peakier mass, you are better able to distinguish your signal from your background, including your combinatorial spectrum, kind of. Um, and and then that should translate into more sensitivity, and that's a project that we've been ongoing with. Uh, some of the students. So in this plot here, this is just the invariant mass. You can see the delta R sum in green again does terribly at producing a peak at, in this case, one TeV is, is the signal mass. Rate. And and if you want to see the peak here, you have to throw away all the stuff which is sitting there at low PT. 
we've already thrown away so much of your signal, right? These are normalized to one. And, and so by the time you're actually looking at looking for a peak at one TeV, your, uh, your actual signal efficiency is, is quite bad. In the orange, this is the mass asymmetry method, works significantly better, but you can still see there's this long uh, shoulder view on the left. Um, and by far the best one here is, is this cannonball, which does a really pretty good job of, uh, of reproducing the truth distribution here, which is just interesting. Um, uh, and so this is incredibly close to that distribution. So this is almost as good as you can do. Of course, there was some headroom uh, on that uh, fraction of correct events slot. We could do a little better, and we're certainly trying to figure out how to do that. So that's to say that using this approach should uh, 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 imply more sensitivity in the actual bump on search that you would do. Now the question for us is really, yes, we're interested in this, but we're really interested in the problems that are really, really much harder. Does this approach scale? Can you make the network bigger and have this work? You know, this kind of thing. How, how much more do you have to train to, to handle this 10 jet scenario? This kind of thing. Something that we'll look at more than right now. But yeah, so kind of in conclusion, um, the goal here in, in this particular research thrust is to attack these very large dimensional uh, feature space problems like the ones described here. Um, and, and in this approach, you end up finding that there's lots of room left for discovery of new stuff at low mass. That is just too hard to deal with, and that's what we haven't really spent much time doing. Um, and that's to say hidden under the standard model backgrounds, but also other backgrounds like the combinatorial backgrounds that are even inherent in the signal itself. We could be hiding these signals um, and, 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 um, and this is just because of our lack of a tool set in four dimensions. Um, and in general, we're not trying to use machine learning to just eke out a tiny bit more exclusion power. Right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to enable searches that are otherwise impossible or incredibly hard that might still have a bunch of discovery potential. And that's it. Thank you very much. You want to share? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, at least for the, for example, the top mass of the Tevatron, we would put emphasis. What's the kind of this matrix element for, for example? If your theory prediction is correct for signal and background, that, that in some sense just you know what the PDF is in one dimensional space and yeah. you can solve the problem. Yeah. How much could you it was maybe that to what you would like to try to do and how much of that is different for yeah, so that I mean that's similar, similar to the problems that I mean Chris and I have been working together for years on uh, to, to kind of answer this this question in some way. Of course, using something like the matrix element method, um, unless you're going to do a scan over unknown masses, because of course in this case we don't know what the stop is going to be, um, uh, is is not going to be that practical in the end. Um, to, to, to kind of do all these calculations and play that game. Um, you can use that information in some way. Um, and we have played with that a little bit. Um, but I think with a combinatorial problem here, having information about the matrix element doesn't automatically give you a solution to the combinatorial problem. But it also, but it also predicts what one combination wants. It uh, it predicts what they could look like, yeah. And so on a on a on an aggregate statistical way, yeah, you know what the shapes might look like. But I think on an event by event, yeah, I mean, I mean, event, yeah. By event thing, for example, for the four jet problem, yeah, yeah, we have a few different combinations. But in the matrix element approach, under the two hypotheses, you have a well-defined for each particular potential point in front of space with a lot of time value for the two different zero masses as well as the correct mass. 
if you know the correct mass, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so by the time you want to repeat that over an unknown mass, right? I don't know how that works. Yeah, because we don't know if this is a 500 dV or 1.5 TV. We've got to figure that out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, there's another issue with the matrix element in that you need to numerically choose a basis to represent those degrees of freedom in. Mm -hmm. And of course, mathematically, any basis is equivalent in terms of probabilities. You just do the transformation. But if you're going to bin this thing and need to model it numerically, if you choose the wrong combinatorics and expand everything out of the matrix element, you may have incredibly inefficient bidding in the mm -hmm. sense that it may not be uniformly distributed in the way you think it should be through that space. And certainly for backgrounds that yeah. don't follow the same matrix element, it could be right. practically, yeah, exactly. not only is there a dimensionality issue, it's like, you gotta, you gotta represent these somehow the matrix element. And usually people just bin them in a uniformish way yeah. on what, what they expect, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I had a question not on the matrix element, but is it, so, so as I understand it, the idea behind Cannonball is basically the way of designing a neural network to add in this, this Lawrence layer to give you out, you know, new kinematic variables. Is that correct? Um, the output is not new kinematic variables, right? Because mm -hmm. it's it's just this interpretation. Okay. It's, it's just the it's just it's interpretation the, of how you decide. It's, yeah, it's just the pairing, right? And once you have that pairing, let's let's ignore radiation for a second. Let's just it, it chooses one of those three uh, possible combinations. Then you have all the freedom in the world to construct any variable you want. And and then we of course then can use our physics intuition to say, okay, I'm going to try to find these peaking masses and this kind of thing, or look for back to backness or, or whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 what I think the the that flexibility is super important. So it's right. to like follow up question yeah. to that then. So in, in my opinion, we had this problem and you kind of hinted at this earlier at CMS and Atlas where we have people that like to take schematic variables, throw them into a neural network and hope that magic happens. Right, right, right. So how robust in a sense, and maybe this is a fair, fair or well, well, well word question, but how robust is is cannonball to that, right? If say three years from now someone sees your, your paper on this and then wants to, you know, chuck it at, you know, is it gonna perform that much better than the traditional chuck a bunch of random you know, variables into it like that? Um I don't know. I I suspect that for this, it is not going to do um, that much better or worse than, a, mm -hmm. than something you know mindless. Right. Not to be too. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I agree. But, but, but other people agree. <laughs> but, the, but the big but the big thing for me is that I think when you get up to the higher multiplicities, right. it might. My hope is that this approach scales and the other doesn't. Right. Because the thing is, in terms of the stuff that the network needs to learn, right. we're reducing the burden on that network by doing this. And so it, it, I hope, means that the training will actually converge to the 40 dimensions right. uh, in a way that it wouldn't when you're just throwing. It's not necessarily your problem if it doesn't work, but it's just what Yeah, it's no, no, exactly. But, no, happens. but this is very much the, the thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Make sure I'm understanding what, what you're talking about here. To an extent, when you're doing machine learning, you don't want to throw the kitchen sink at it. Yeah. The more junk you give it, the harder the job you're making this. And yeah. we're very simplistically, naively speaking, I guess you say, we're just doing a fit. Yeah. And you throw a ton of variables in a fit, you're going to get a bad fit. Mm -hmm. So it's a, all the issues, all the art of doing a fit involved here. So what you're doing, you're saying, I know how to solve some of this data. To get it down to a smaller space to find some limited abstract. But I got this one point where I need to do some combinatronics in here. Yeah. So I need to massage the data here. Then I need to do a machine learning task to the fit the combinations. And then I have some more data massaging that I can do. And then I need to go machine learning to machine learning. So you're basically just folding in some data reduction yeah. into your steps. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. Like training wheels. 
Yes, yes, time. exactly. No, that's a great way to think about it. I mean, we're, we're just helping it along a little bit, making it travel a little easier. And then Sorry. what is the ISR tagging doing for the analysis? Yeah, so that's, that's part of the network. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like you have the ISR's uh, output. Yeah. Yeah, so or we take in this case, we allow up to one additional jet. So we have five uh, inputs and we are tasking it with with our labels basically to say also tell us which four to, to deal with solve this five choose four problem for us uh, and so for those five deaths uh, there's going to be mm -hmm. a, a, a probability that uh, we'll, 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 we'll take like the, the, the highest isr score uh, and throw away that jet not consider it in this which there are probably better ways of doing that but right this is what we're doing. and then in your plot of the mass peak with the different networks. Um, yes, because you talked some about the, the shoulder on the left side. Yeah. Is, is the tail on the right side also understood the by um, near like 1.5 or something? Yeah. Um, no, no, no is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, We think that this end has to do with the handling of the ISR. Okay. Less clear. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Do you think it'd be possible to translate, not necessarily like the architecture, but like I guess the essence of the Cannonball um, algorithm into an unsupervised network? Or if, if that would be tractable or like even helpful? Maybe. <laughs> I was the, just curious. The, I, the ISR side, I, I could see how that might work. Um, for the for the actual pairing or for the kind of pure combinatorial part of it, um, I can totally see how in some way kind of basically clustering in a mass space could mm -hmm. happen. Especially once you're you've taught it how to think in a mass space this easily. Yeah, totally, I can see how it might work, but I, I haven't played through the full exercise. Sure, yeah, yeah exactly. just off the top of your head. Exactly. I was curious. Yeah, and yeah. I know there's a lot of obviously dimensionality issues, so I don't know if that would just make it kind of intractable or right, if right. it actually maybe. I don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I had two questions. One's a little more physics-y. Mm -hmm. um, so with these RPV couplings, right? Presumably when you turn on these RPV couplings, you don't turn off the previously existing right. our parity constraints, right. Yeah. right? So which is why it might it's still interesting to look at the pair production of the stops. Right. Then decay. Yeah. Is there any sense or intuition or argument about if you were to turn these on, what the relative strength or scale or branching ratios should be? Is there any guidance or is it just? It depends on who you ask. Okay. Um, so you can treat these if you want as free parameters. That's of course not a very um, nice kind of way of thinking about it. There are uh, uh, frameworks in which you can, for example, have these things uh, kind of mirror the Apollo sector and have have the flavor structure be defined uh, in that way. There are also uh, theories for how to um, uh, have these, these couplings be uh, present in some dynamical way, which then drives these, these, the scale of these couplings down which then, of course, helps with things like proton decay, and then also ends up giving long life particle signatures. Right. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a lot of different stuff here. We're definitely, uh, at least through uh, my career, uh, mostly focused on individual couplings uh, and and, uh, and just seeing what we can do with the signature. Well, really one of the defined couplings could be constrained by electroporic structures. By leptocorc searches, for sure. Yeah. All of these, all these the leptons, uh, lepton number violating uh, terms are pretty well constrained indeed, uh, uh, especially given the fact that um, these will all give rise to neutrinos in the final state, where they can. And so that means your MET searches are going to have a little bit of 
of sensitivity. So your traditional SUSE program doesn't have to die there. Um, this is largely why I focus on the number violating because that's a lot harder to, 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 to kind of detail. Um, yeah, and one of the exercises we did uh, on Atlas um, a couple of years ago that I'm really proud of, we played the game of what happens as you vary the size of this coupling and what kind of constraints do we have from traditional searches, long lived searches, RPV searches um, as a function of the strength of lambda double prime. Uh, I don't know if I actually have any. Actually, I do have a for example, like this, this plot is one that we made as a function of the strength of this coupling. What is our in this case, stop mass limit? And we went to this huge reinterpretation effort to kind of carve out the space to see if we have any holes left. And if we do, kind of here and here, and then we sort of target those and I'm working with the student right now to understand some sensitivity um, reinterpretations for that hole there. You said in the standard model that. <clears throat> Left on a very odd number are kind of accidental. Does that mean we just observe those in our experiments, but there are um, yeah, an accidental kind of symmetry? An something? accidental symmetry is one where there's not a fundamental symmetry, but it's that um, any coupling that would violate these numbers uh, is of too high a dimension to actually show up in your Lagrangian. So you don't end up with a coupling in your Lagrangian, but that's uh, just because it's kind of too too hard to have done that. Um, but yeah, but it's not a symmetry. Okay. So let's thank our speaker again for a wonderful seminar. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. If there's additional questions, people can hang around and ask. Otherwise, I think we will close the seminar for today. Thank you for everyone.